Space Tourists. Uh, his foundation out of South Africa is de uh, has actually purchased a large publisher and is making uh, slowly over the next few months all of the an entire K-12 curriculum available completely for free and open access uh, via uh, via connections. This is something that that they are uh, targeting in order to reform the very problematic educational system in, in South Africa. But this material is su of such high quality that we see without a doubt it's going to get used all across North, uh, South America, Europe, and uh, Asia. So we're very, very excited about that. So I'd like to just uh, spend the, the really second half or of, of, of my remarks talking about the sustainability question. And I just have five quick points that I want to make, and hopefully these will help uh, uh, bring up some questions for, for later on in the, the discussion part of the today. Okay, the first point is that the question as usually posed is as follows, right? Are OERs sustainable? And I think this is an important question, but I think people are forgetting a very, I think, an even more important question, which is, is the status quo sustainable, right? And, and meaning the status quo of the way we produce and create and develop and distribute textbooks and learning materials today. And I would say it is absolutely not sustainable. The price of textbooks has rise, risen over two times faster than inflation over the last decade. And basically what's happening is at least large publishing houses are pricing themselves out of the market. Okay? So if, they are, if the status quo is, is, is becoming too expensive, is becoming too burdensome, something is going to come along to challenge that status quo. It might be OER, it might be something else. But I, I think as you're going to see throughout the rest of these talks, open educational resources are a very uh, good contender to be this, this challenge. So here's a case in point. So basically people in, in, in California have, uh, 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 can't take, uh, basically there's a, a crisis in California. The community college tuition is set in California such that the price of textbooks now actually exceeds the price of tuition. Right? So when kids are dropping out of community college in California now, they're dropping out not because they can't afford the tuition, but because they can't buy the books. And the chancellors of, of all the major community colleges in, in California have actually realized that this is a problem. And they basically decided to take matters in the, into their own hands and, and basically do an end, end run around the publishers. So they have formed an organization called the Community College Consortium for open educational resources. There are at, at, at currently about 100 members of this consortium, not only in California, but all across the United States and Canada. And the very first book is actually in, uh, uh, actually being used uh, this semester by about 500 uh, students across uh, the United States. We expect that number to about treble next year. This is a completely free statistics course. It's for the very, very popular uh, math one course in the community college courses of California. So it's completely free uh, using connections and extremely low cost in print. So it's a 600 page book. It used this book, equivalent books cost about $131. This book costs about uh, $31. And the, the goal of this consortium is actually to develop, starting from the top down, t a textbook series for the entire top 10 or top 20 courses that are taken by all of the students at, in the California community colleges. So this is just one example of the challenges that I think uh, traditional publishers are going to be facing. So the second point is uh, when we think about the kind of challenges that, that these publishers are go the publishers are going to face, and, and, and this is really just setting up for some points later, I think we need to, all we need to do to see what's going to be happening with textbooks in the, the present and the near future is really look at two very closely related industries and what has happened in the software industry with the, the rise of, of open source software, which has become a, a, a $35 billion business uh, worldwide over the last decade. And we also just need to look at what's been going on in the music business with a tremendous shaking out of, of the previously large players. Okay, so I'm going to talk a, lo a lot about these over the next uh, couple minutes. But let's talk about the third point, which I think is one of the most important ones. And that is that the educational publishing business, the textbook business, a, lo a large part of the learning materials business is a so-called long-tail uh, uh, long business. 
What I mean is that if you take all of the textbooks that are published by all of the publishing houses around the world and you sort them according to sales or according to dollars for their sale, uh, you will see that it forms what's called a, a, heavy, uh, a long tail or a heavy tail. And, and what that means is that there are a few books out here that are the Harry Potters of physics, the Harry Potters of economics, that truly do sell hundreds of thousands or even millions uh, 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 of copies over their lifetime. Okay? So there are a few of these books. This, of course, is where the publishers are trying to shoot for. This is what every one of you dreams about when you think of writing your own textbook. Right? I'm going to write the Harry Potter of economics. Unfortunately, the fact, the, the sad reality, not sad reality, but the reality is that uh, most textbooks and learning materials out there are on topics very un-Harry Potter-like, topics like hypergeometric partial differential equations, right? It's, it's this long tail that provides the tremendous diversity of educational opportunity, okay? But the very, very important thing is that there's just... They're very small sales and not a lot of money in here. And, and, and this is very, very similar to the music world, okay, directly in parallel, where basically one, under 1% 1 of all musicians make well over 99% of all of the money in the music business. Okay? And at the other end of the long tail, we get the tremendous bands uh, that, that represent the, 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 the fringe or the, the, the diversity of the music world. Okay? So when you really think about this, there's really two important issues. The first is that most content is actually uneconomical for large publishers to publish. The standard models that publishers think about when they think of textbooks are designed to work here. They don't work very well here. That's why we have textbooks now that cost $200 or 200 euros. Okay? The second is, from the, the, the authoring side, is that most authors of books down here Right? They're not doing it for the money. They're not doing it to make royalties. Well, they better not be because they're not going to make any. Right? They're either going to make very little or, or no royalties. I know large numbers of authors whose royalty stream is negative. Right? They owe the publisher money because the publisher did extra typesetting, added extra value to the book, and they're never going to make money. Right? And the key thing is very much like in open source software, very much like in the music world, the people that generate the content content actually earn their livelihoods in other ways. There are just not that many people out there who make a very good living writing learning content. Does that mean five? Okay. So the fourth point is uh, <clears throat> now pulling, pulling things back into, uh, uh, instead of talking about challenges to the publishing industry, how can OER be compatible? I think a really important uh, uh, point that I always try and bring up is that a lot of people in the OER world have an adversarial attitude towards for-profits in general and, and, and publishers in particular. And I think this is a tremendous shame, okay? Uh, and, and actually is, is, is a, a big problem, okay? Because in fact, open educational resources can be completely compatible with for-profit uh, enterprises. And if you use, for example, licenses like the Creative Commons Attribution License, okay, in particular, a license that allows commercial use of the material, then it enables a couple things. It enables commercial entities like publishers to, to do what they do best, which is add value. Add value to open educational resources, which is good for people, right? That's good for the users. And, and another thing that's good for both the publishers and for the people is that it enables tremendous new opportunities for, for outreach, for global community involvement in tremendous number of languages and a tremendous number of different applications. Just think very briefly, think about Wikipedia that has been translate, translated and developed in dozens of different languages. There's no way that, that a publisher of a textbook can do that. The only uh, books that ever get translated into a large number of different languages are these blockbuster Harry Potter-like books, which is, is a big problem because it limits diversity of educational, uh, educational ideas. So let's just give some quick case studies of this. Okay? The first is let's just think very briefly about open source software and think about how these ideas, like Red Hats, show of hands, Red Hat, Right? Where would Linux be without companies like Red Hat? Okay, what is Red Hat? They're a company that sells Linux. Linux is something that is completely free and completely open source. You can download it from the web. 
However, how do a lot of organizations and businesses actually install this open source software? They actually pay a company. And this company, Red Hat, makes a lot of money every year. Okay, why do they make a lot of money? Okay, why do companies do